Okay, uh, welcome to the HL Colloquium. Uh, let's get started. Welcome. Uh, today we're very ha happy to have uh, Professor Paul Kasak here from the uh, University of uh, West Virginia. Uh, Paul got his uh, Bachelor's of Science uh, in Math and Physics from uh, Arizona, University of Arizona, and a Master's degree in uh, Wisconsin Madison. And in 2006, he got his uh, PhD in physics from the University of uh, Maryland. And then he uh, was in Delaware, University of Delaware, for a year or so for a postdoc uh, before he joined the faculty at uh, uh, West Virginia. And uh, recently, he has been promoted uh, to associate professor and also got tenure. Congratulations. And uh, his main interest, uh, research interest, is in magnetic reconnection and the uh, applications using uh, analytical techniques, numerical simulations, and observations. Uh, he received the AGU uh, Fred L. Scarf Award in 2008 and uh, for his uh, dissertation research and also was invited to, to deliver a S SPD Parker uh, lecture. Uh, today he will discuss magnetic reconnection from solar flares to uh, dayside magnetopause. Thanks, Anli. Uh, so thank you all for coming. Uh, it was always a pleasure to come to Boulder. Um, I was telling the guys at lunch that I was here last year, right around the same time, and that was right when you got that big blizzard. And so I couldn't even get, I rented a car at the airport, and I couldn't even get to Boulder. I had to pull off, off somewhere in the uh, you know, outskirts of Denver. Uh, so the weather today is much nicer. <laughs> I, uh, I appreciate all that. Um, so. Given the background at HAO, you know, the, such the diverse background, I was having trouble deciding what topic to talk about, whether I should talk about solar physics or magnetospheric physics. So I talked to Han Lee about it and ended up deciding to just kind of do both. Um, so it's really, I'm hoping that this is very informal and, you know, we'll just see what people are interested in. I'll kind of spend more time on that. I have more stuff prepared than I have time to do. So whatever we get to is fine. Um, just a list here at the bottom of my uh, collaborators. The underlined ones, those are either students or uh, postdocs that have been in my group, either have been or are currently in my group. Um, so a lot of this that I'll be presenting today is uh, work that they've been doing. So let's see here. Okay, so um, I figure since HAO has been around for 75 years, been doing this for a long time, um, happy anniversary, by the way. Um, I thought, I'm figuring most people are probably uh, familiar with a lot of the background science of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, space, solar and space physics. So uh, kind of have a brief introduction. Um, so space weather, as you probably know, um, the stuff on the sun can affect us on Earth. So this is a, an alarming graphic by the folks at NASA. Um, the key for us today is that um, the sun has these eruptions, so solar flares, coronal mass ejections, um, and that material can run into Earth, uh, the, or the Earth's magnetic field anyway, and when it does that, it, there's an interaction between the solar wind and the uh, magnetic, uh, the magnetosphere, um, and that can produce geomagnetic storms or substorms, which can affect us uh, in many ways for space weather. Um, so, Taking each of those parts, the first part is these eruptions, so flares and coronal mass ejections release huge amounts of energy. Um, that energy is coming from the magnetic field, and it's thought to be initiated at very small scales by magnetic reconnection. And uh, reconnection, in case you haven't seen this before, occurs where magnetic fields pointing in opposite directions come together. Uh, so this is a movie I like showing that gives you a scale of what the difference between the large scale and the small scale is in the case of these solar eruptions. So you're zooming in quite a bit, uh, and then finally you get that close, and this is RESI data showing uh, x-rays from a flare, and you can see what happens when you get the coronal mass ejection on the large scale. So it's thought that magnetic reconnection is happening at that smallest scale where the x-rays are produced, uh, and giving rise to these huge events. Okay, so the second aspect of that is what happens when it reaches Earth. So um, geomagnetic storms and geomagnetic substorms occur. So um, as you may know, or probably know, um, the effect it has on the Earth's magnetosphere uh, is very dependent on 
uh, the direction of the interplanetary magnetic field, and that also comes down to magnetic reconnection. So if the magnetic field coming in from the solar wind, so here the sun would be over here, and the material's going left to right. So if that material, if the magnetic field is aligned in the same direction as the Earth's magnetic field, then uh, you don't get reconnection right here, because they're not anti-parallel. Um, you do get reconnection elsewhere, but it turns out you don't get much coupling from the solar wind to the magnetosphere. But if the uh, interplanetary magnetic field is opposite, then you do get strong coupling. Uh, and so here's an animation of that, in case you haven't seen this. The yellow lines are magnetic field lines. This is from a MHD simulation, Earth's right here. So what you're seeing now is uh, northward interplanetary magnetic field, and you get these field lines breaking up at the top and the bottom, so that breaking is magnetic reconnection. And in this case, there's not a huge amount of energy transfer from the solar wind. And you see there's not much happening in here. And in the simulation, what's going to happen is we switch it now to a mostly southward interplanetary magnetic field, and now reconnection starts happening here. And that totally changes everything, because these magnetic field lines are dragged back to the magneto tail. Uh, they're stretched out, so you're getting a lot of energy transfer from the solar wind, and they come together and break again in mag magnetic reconnection, and it drives material back towards the Earth. Um, so you can see that uh, very different depending on the direction of the magnetic field, and putting it together both at the solar flare level and at the geomagnetic storm level, uh, reconnection plays a huge role. So it's a very important process to study. Um, so what reconnection is, again, if you haven't seen this, um, these are magnetic fields pointing opposite directions, and the idea is they come together, and we talk about it in terms of them breaking and cross-connecting, and when they do that, they form these magnetic fields that are very bent, and bent field lines want to straight out, straighten out, and uh, they give you jets to the left and right in this picture, and so you're, that's how it converts the energy from the magnetic field into flow and into heat. Um, some, a few things that are just important for um, where I'm going with this talk uh, is magnetic fields <coughs> don't have to be perfectly anti-parallel. Um, if they're like this, uh, there's a component that's anti-parallel and there's a component that's uh, not anti-parallel. So the component that's not anti-parallel is called the guide field. Um, so that's a special case. We'll talk about guide field in a little bit. Um, there has to be some sort of dissipation mechanism in order for those magnetic field lines to break. And um, it's such a complicated process. It doesn't look all that complicated, but it, it's so complicated that um, we often start by just doing 2D studies. So I'll be showing magnetic uh, reconnection simulations in 2D, and I'll also show you some in 3D. Um, and it's challenging because it's a multi-scale issue. So let me, this is an animation here. Um, now the magnetic field lines are in black, and so this is sort of what it looks like in one of these 2D simulations, the magnetic fields coming together from the top and bottom, uh, and then they start breaking and moving off to the sides. So you can see that it's right where the field line's breaking, that's very small scale physics, and as we saw uh, at the large scale, is uh, it, you know, reconnection has a big impact on the large scale. So. Um, just again for introductory purposes, um, you may have heard <laughs> that um, there's recently a launch of the MMS satellite mission. Um, it was on, uh, launched on March 12th. This was a picture that I took through um, a, uh, a fence, uh, just stuck the camera between there, uh, the morning of the launch, and then this is of course the evening of the launch. Um, so uh, MMS is going up uh, specifically to study those smaller scales of magnetic reconnection uh, in the magnetosphere. So I won't have too much more to say about the MMS mission, but just wanted to make contact with, you, with, you, with that in case you've heard of it. Um, so here's sort of an outline of a number of things that we can talk about today. Um, and these are various aspects of reconnection. Uh, both from the planetary, from the magnetospheric side and also from the solar side. Um, so the first one that I'll probably go through is talking about what happens when you try to understand reconnection at the Earth's magnetopause. And so there's special things that are different than the pictures I just showed you. There's asymmetries in the magnetic field. There are different field strengths, different densities on either side. 
Uh, and you can also have um, flow going parallel to the magnetic field, which we didn't include in that diagram. So it's very important for, again, magnetospheres. Um, talking about in, for planetary magnetospheres, including Earth, where does reconnection even happen? And what does it look like in the global magnetospheric setting? Uh, and then this one is a, a study of 3D rec reconnection, and it has a number of applications, but um, the ones uh, I would spend the most time on here would be coronal applications, so solar flares. It uh, also happens in the solar wind. And then we probably won't have time for it, but there's an uh, uh, interesting result that we've gotten lately on uh, a mechanism for fast reconnection. So if you're interested, we'll do that at the end. Um, so again, jump in with questions or whatever as you are, as you have them. So this is uh, again the study of asymmetric reconnection with the flow shear. So the picture to have in your head here is at the Earth. Uh, you have the magnetosphere looking like this. So when the uh, magnetic, when the interplanetary magnetic field was northward, we saw the reconnection was happening at the top and the bottom at the cusps. So when reconnection is at the cusps, that means the solar wind is coming in and getting deflected around the magnetosphere. And so there's a component of the flow that's parallel to the, the magnetic field that's reconnecting. <laughs> um, and so that flow, uh, it's known that that flow is there. And um, what we're doing is we're trying to study how that flow affects the reconnection process. Um, so, um, in so the other thing that I mentioned is that the magnetic field strengths and the densities of the plasmas on the two sides are very different. And so what there's been a number of studies on asymmetric reconnection, and there's been a number of studies on reconnection with the flow shear, but um, not too many studies of the two put together. So that's basically what this one is. Um, so we're really going to try to quantify um, theoretically and numerically what, how the reconnection acts when you have both of these effects. And some of the results, I would say, were surprising. At, at least I was surprised by them. Um, so one thing is uh, if you, what, you know, the simplest way to study what happens with flow shear is to go into the reference frame where uh, the flows are equal and opposite uh, above and below where reconnection is happening. So if you do that, let's say you're studying symmetric reconnection. Um, what you'd find is that the reconnection site would just stay where it started because uh, you know it's symmetric. Everything's symmetric, so nothing surprising would happen. Uh, so it turns out that in asymmetric reconnection, that all changes. So even if the flow shears or the flow speeds are equal and opposite above and below, you find that the uh, reconnection site uh, where the magnetic field lines break, that's called the X line, um, that can move with the flow, um, and so. This, in this diagram, you have uh, basically anything with a one subscript is above and anything with a two subscript is below. And so here we're allowing for a flow parallel to the magnetic field above and below. Um, so what's interesting about this is that uh, we, Mike Shea and I, uh, a number of years ago, showed that when you have asymmetric reconnection, the X line, the place where the field lines break, shift to one side or the other of um, the region where those field lines break, the dissipation region. And so what that means is that, uh, and you also have the stagnation point. So the stagnation point is where the flow from one side meets the flow from the other side. So in asymmetric reconnection, those two points don't have to be the same place, whereas in symmetric reconnection, they're at the same place. So what that means is that uh, the flow from one side comes in, uh, and when it reaches the stagnation point, it gets shot off to the side. And so what that means is that the upstream plasmas contribute different amounts to what's going on inside the dissipation region. And so if they carry momentum in the direction of the magnetic field, they'll contribute their momentum differently. And so even if they're equal and opposite, uh, you can get a net momentum of the dissipation region. Okay, and you can do a little analysis, which I won't take you through, but we predicted that the drift speed should be given by this formula here, and it's basically the flow speeds on either side uh, weighted in some way by the uh, magnetic fields and the densities upstream. Yeah? Um, in this, we're, like, we're thinking of it as though the reconnection is going on already and it's steady. So whether it's forced or if it's started on its own, either way. <laughs>
There's an interesting issue with that that'll come up in a moment. Um, if the flow is too big, it can actually suppress the reconnection and it can even shut it off. So I'll show you that in a minute. Yeah, good question. Okay, so actually here it is right now. So the question is how fast does reconnection go? And the reason that this flow can slow down reconnection is if you think about a magnetic field line that's already undergone reconnection, um, in the standard reconnection process, this field line straightens out, you know, it shoots off in this case to the left. Okay? But if you have an upstream flow, then this field line straightening out has to fight against the flow coming in. And uh, because of that, uh, it, can, uh, it slows down the whole process. So it turns out that for symmetric reconnection, we showed that uh, the reconnection rate goes down like this, where it's related to the flow shear and the alphane speed uh, of the, the plasma. So in asymmetric reconnection, you'd say, well, maybe it's the same kind of thing. Maybe it slows down just in proportion to uh, an asymmetric version of the alphane speed. Um, it turns out it's more complicated. We think it's more complicated than that. And the, uh, the reason is that it's, it's the same idea. It's that the stagnation point where the flows meet uh, isn't right in the middle. It's off to one side. So in the case of the Earth's magnetosphere, it's pushed almost all the way to the magnetospheric side. So basically, almost all the plasma in the dissipation region comes from the magnetosheath. Um, and because of that, that's contributing more to fighting that straightening field line than the magnetosphere would be. And so, again, I'm not going to go through the details unless you want, but you can make some sort of prediction of what you expect the outflow speed to be and how that would relate, how that would generalize this expression to tell you what, uh, how the, what the reconnection rate would be with these flow shears. Okay. And then, again, this other really important question is, uh, you can shut off reconnection if the flow shear is fast enough. And with that, there's been a lot of work on this going back a long time. Um, even analytically, you can show that for symmetric reconnection, if the flow is super alphanic, it basically kills off the reconnection and you get Kelvin-Helmholtz instability instead. Okay, makes perfect sense. Um, so when we started this, we were thinking, well, okay, if you go to an asymmetric system, then it should just still be, if it's still faster than the asymmetric version of the alphane speed, then that would shut off reconnection. But this suggests that that simple argument isn't true. So if you go back to this expression and just solve for where the electric field goes to zero, the, the rate of reconnection goes to zero, it gives you this as the condition for shutting off reconnection. And it's the, uh, the asymmetric version of the alphane speed, but it's weighted by some factor. And that factor is always bigger than one, one or bigger, right? So in the limit that it's symmetric, this is just one, and you do get uh, just the alphane speed. But in the limit that one of these is bigger than the other, which is the important limit for the Earth's magnetosphere, because the densities are so different at the magnetosphere, it turns out this is much bigger than the asymmetric version of the alphane speed. So just to plug in numbers to see how this works, um, there's an event that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Uh, here's uh, magnetic fields and densities. So you can see the magnetic field ratio is about between four and six and the density ratio is over 100, right? And this is not very atypical. I mean, this is pretty standard. And so if you plug that in and find out how fast the solar wind has to be in order to shut off reconnection, you find that it's 22 times the asymmetric alphane speed. So it just says that it's ridiculously difficult for flow shear to shut off reconnection for magnetospheric parameters. And the reason is this picture here because the magnetospheric plasma is hardly doing anything. It's really just the magnetosheath moves the, you know, the, the reconnection site with the magnetosheath, and then it's really just the magnetosphere that's doing anything, and it's hardly there. It's hardly playing a role. Okay? So we think that, um, oops. So we think this really sort of changes the picture, because we were really thinking that uh, just super alphanic flow would be enough to kill off reconnection. Now, I, I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, and also, similarly, the effect on the reconnection rate is going to be pretty small. So again, I was thinking that flow shear would really change how fast reconnection would go based on what we know from the symmetric case, but now I'm not so sure for the asymmetric case. Um, so real quick, I'm going to take you through some simulations we did to test these. Um, 
for all the simulation stuff I'm going to show you, I'm not going to really give you any of the details of what we did, but definitely ask if you have any questions. Um, these were two-dimensional simulations, though, um, and we did a series of different um, magnetic field asymmetries and different density asymmetries. Um, so here's a sample. Oh, and in all the simulations, the flow shear was or the flow was equal and opposite. Yeah. This is definitely yes, without guide field. Right, all without a guide field. It turns out a guide field introduces another interesting effect, uh, which we have not included. So we definitely need to include that for applications. Yes. Taking account what? Um, The up, we're basically taking the upstream parameters as given, so they're basically not changing. They're fixed in that regard. Yeah. Good. All right. So um, here in this simulation, this is uh, a simulation with asymmetric magnetic fields by a factor of three, and you can see that the flow shear on either side was 1.2 in units of the Alfane speed. So uh, sure enough, you see the X line move, which you wouldn't expect for symmetric reconnection. And when we did this for a, a large number of different um, upstream flow shears and compared the drift speed with what we predicted, they're basically right on. So that seems to work pretty well. Um, in terms of the reconnection rate, uh, we looked at this is this top one is for the simulations with asymmetric magnetic fields, and it seems to do pretty good. This one looks a little low. Um, that one had a big magnetic island kind of come up and inter interfere with things. So. That would be the one to trust the least, and that's the one that does the worst. So I think we're okay with that. And this was for a bunch of simulations with symmetric magnetic fields but asymmetric densities, and that seems to do pretty well also. So uh, seems to work pretty well. Um, and then the suppression condition, what does it take to suppress reconnection? Um, for the, the case where the magnetic fields are different by a uh, factor of three, uh, the critical uh, speed would be 2. And so we did a simulation for 1.6 and we got reconnection. We did a simulation for 2.4 and indeed, I mean this is early but it's definitely going Kelvin Helmholtz unstable. It's not undergoing reconnection like we're used to. Um, so that seems consistent. Uh, we'd really have to pin that down a little further if we wanted to <laughs> make a more strong case. But anyway, it's mostly consistent. And then this one for the asymmetric densities, the critical speed would be 2 thirds. And for 0.6, we get reconnection. For 0.8, we don't. So that seems pretty consistent, too. So the theory seems to work well. What about observations? So um, these were the numbers I used earlier were from this event by Rick Wilder at, uh, just up the road at LASP. Um, so what he saw is uh, an event with cluster where the um, cluster 1 saw reconnection jets go by, and then uh, cluster 3 was a little further down, and then it saw the same jets go by. And so from that, the time of flight, you can figure out how fast everything's going and things like that. So in this case, they basically measured that the convec convection speed of the X-line was basically the same as the solar wind flow speed. And that's exactly what we would predict for these really asymmetric systems. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is the asymmetric uh, Alfane speed for this case was about 75 kilometers per second, and the flow speed was 106. So the solar wind speed was faster than the uh, Alfane speed. So before this project, I would have said, well, OK, maybe it's going to suppress reconnection. But uh, now what we would say it doesn't. And sure enough, I mean, they're seeing reconnection. So it, it seems like that also is consistent. Um, so that this uh, was work done. Um, Chris Doss is my undergraduate student. He's been working on this. He's done a fantastic job. I think he's one of these uh, students to watch for. <laughs> he's going to be really good. Um, so uh, hopefully we're going to submit in a couple of weeks on this. Um, OK, so. Uh, that's all I wanted to share with you on, on that. Um, I was going to move on to some other stuff. Uh, again, jump in with questions if you have them. So this is um, sort of a big picture question that has been going on for a long time. The question is, uh, where does reconnection even occur at the dayside magnetopause uh, as a function of what's going on in the solar wind? Um, 
And you know, so I, we just did this whole project of just a simple 2D reconnection model. Do, do 2D reconnection models have anything to do with the real magnetosphere? I mean, the real magnetosphere is 3D, right? So um, there's, I think people are really starting uh, only recently to really you know, figure this question out. So I think it's a really exciting time on this. Um, I think sort of the bigger picture of this that we hope to address is this question of local versus global control of the reconnection process at the magnetopause. Um, so going back a long time, the idea was whatever the solar wind tells the magnetosphere to do, that's what it'll do. Um, and then the local idea, that, so that's the global picture, and the, the local idea that's been getting some discussion lately is that you know, what's going on right at the magnetopause might actually contribute. So which is right? Um, so these are really big questions, and I think we're, we're getting to the point where we're going to start being able to address these things. Um, so uh, maybe I'll skip this, some of this part. But uh, the idea is that we want to, again, locate where the reconnection is happening and understand uh, how, you know, where it occurs and whether the 2D models work for any of these things. Um, so it turns out there's a really nice way to think about this, uh, and it's, you're called magnetic separators. The idea is really easy to picture. Uh, so here in this case, sorry, everything's flipped. So the sun on this picture would be off to the right. And so these lines are lines from the interplanetary magnetic field. Uh, and then these red ones are the Earth's magnetic field lines. And these white ones at the top and the bottom are ones that have already undergone reconnection. So they're half attached to the Earth and half off to the solar wind. Okay, so you can see that they all meet at one point. And in this case, this had due southward IMF. So reconnection would be expected to happen right there. And that's where that point is. So that point is what separates the different, they're called magnetic topologies, right? Um, and so the, you know, if you want to say, well, where does reconnection happen? It's equivalent to saying, well, where do these magnetic topologies meet? Because that's where the magnetic fields are, are breaking. Okay, so in this case, we know exactly where it is. It's right there. For, uh, for no dipole tilt, uh, you know, reconnection only happens in the ecliptic plane. That one's a pretty simple case. But what if the interplanetary magnetic field is just totally doing something different? What if you include dipole tilt? All these types of questions. So it turns out this idea of a separator is still valid. Um, so for independent of what's going on in the solar wind, there will be a line that connects all four magnetic topologies. And you can call that the separator. And that's where reconnection would be likely to happen. So the question of where does reconnection happen turns into well, where are the separators? OK? Uh, and so my student came up, uh, Colin Komar. Uh, he just defended his thesis on this stuff two days ago, <laughs> so it's pretty fresh. Um, so in 2013, he came up with an idea for how to find separators in global magnetospheric simulations. Um, the idea is that separators end on magnetic nulls, where the magnetic field goes to zero. And people already knew how to find where magnetic nulls are in simulations. So you can do that. And basically, you put a hemisphere around it of some radius. And you, everywhere in that uh, hemisphere, you say, well, what is the topology of the magnetic field? Is it closed or is it open? Uh, is it um, solar wind, right? And you find the point on that surface where they all meet. And that's where the separator is going through that surface. So that's this point right there. And then you just repeat the process. Put another hemisphere around it, and you keep doing the same thing. And so you sort of march along the separator until you get to the other null, and you found the whole separator. Um, so it's really nice because it's pretty simple to visualize. Uh, it's robust. It pretty much always works. Um, and it's pretty efficient. Uh, that said, Alex Gloser has been doing some work going beyond this, finding more efficient ways. Um, so there's probably better ways to do it than what we did it. But um, anyway, it, it works. As long as you get the answer, that's part of it. Um, and for those of you in the solar field, um, this should work in, in the solar setting as well. Um, you know, in the solar corona, for example, you're looking for where reconnection happens. Um, so let me just uh, sort of take you through this. So we first wanted to make sure this worked. So we just took a very simple example of uh, a vacuum superposition model. So you have a, a perfect point dipole magnetic field, and you add just a uniform magnetic field to it. Um, in this case, it turns out where the separators, where the nulls are and where the separators are, uh, there's analytic solutions for it. 
those are given here, and I won't go through that. Um, the important point is down here, so we did tests on that to see if it works. So the symbols of various colors are where this technique finds the separator, and the solid lines are the exact solution. And these are for different uh, angles of that uniform field. So you can see it works. Um, so that gave us some confidence to put this into a global magnetospheric simulations. It should work regardless. There's a number of codes out there for this, but it should work regardless of what code you're using. Um, we used BATS RS uh, at CCMC, NASA's uh, CCMC Com Community Coordinated Modeling Center. Um, I'm not going to go through all these details. We used um, unrealistic solar wind parameters to make the numerics easier, but we don't think that should play much of a role. The one thing that is kind of different is that we used an explicit resistivity. So of course the real magnetosphere is not very collisional. So um, this is completely, completely a numerical device. But the idea is that we're forcing the, re the, um, the resistivity to play the role of breaking the magnetic fields rather than, forcing, rather than allowing the grid to do it. And that makes, uh, makes us reproducible and um, it's something that we can you know, measure physical electric fields from that when we do that. Um, so here's some results. This is a result from a simulation with a clock angle of the interplanetary magnetic field pointing left right. Uh, no dipole tilt, so the Earth's magnetic field is pointing up down. And so this red line is what we find for the um, separator. And you can see the field lines to the left are all, um, they start up here, you know, go uh, towards the Earth. And on this side they go off to the solar wind. And on the other side they start down here and go off to the solar wind. Um, outside of the, the page are all interplanetary magnetic fields, and inside are all um, terrestrial fields. So this is the separator for that um, particular simulation. And then we did that for a number of different uh, orientations of the interplanetary magnetic field. And uh, interestingly, it basically just rotates, um, which we were a little surprised at. We thought the shape might change a little bit, but it didn't really do that. Um, and then all I wanted to show with this plot here is that a common technique that people had used previously to try to get close to a magnetic separator is to use the last closed field line on the Sun-Earth line. So the idea is you start at Earth and you just look at the topology of the field and it's closed, it's closed, it's closed, and then all of a sudden you get out into the solar wind. And so right where that changeover happens, that's where that separator is. Um, so we showed here this, the blue dots are the separator we found um, for, uh, this was for 30 degrees, uh, the, the magnetic field making a 30 degree angle with the dipole field. Uh, and the red line is the last closed field line. So you can see they agree basically perfectly. Um, so the last closed field line works um, essentially for northward component IMF. Um, and then this one shows the comparison for southward IMF for 150 degrees. And you can see that right, um, right near the subsolar point, they w agree pretty well. But the last closed field line diverges off from where the separator is. So um, it's sort of a limited applicability for southward IMF to use the last closed field line. Something like this, where you're actually tracing the whole separator, uh, is preferable. Um, yeah? One more? This resistivity, you mean? So, my, my question is more yeah. philosophical one. Uh -huh. Are we learning more about numerical codes than we are about physics by adopting a number like that? I would say it's the exact opposite. I would say our choice of this number was ch specifically chosen to make sure that it's not the numerical code that's giving us the separator. Yeah. Yeah. So where this number came from, where we got this, is we did um, a simulation without any explicit resistivity and just let the code do it. And we got a separation, or we got the current sheet was resolved over about four to six grid cells. And then from that, we calculated what the effective resistivity of the grid was. Okay, and then we kicked it up higher than that, 
and we want, you know, we did like a, a sweet Parker type analysis and chose a value of the resistivity, which was this one, that should make the thickness of that layer bigger than what the grid would want. And then we re-ran it, and sure enough, it was about eight grid cells. So if we used a different resolution, this number would have been different. So I really, this, I would say there's no physics in this. <laughs> But I, for this case, I would say it's, it's really tied to the grid. So if, if we were using a grid that was four times higher resolution, this would change con, uh, consistently with that. OK, so um, one of the things I mentioned that we're interested in is where reconnection happens. So there's a number of models on this. I, I'm not going to go through all the details on this, but there's a number of models of you know, if you tell me what's going on um, on either side of the magnetopause, then I can tell you where reconnection is going to be. Um, haven't really been tested terribly well, and so that's something that we decided to do um, now that we're able to see where uh, the reconnection is actually happening, where the separators are. Um, so in order to do this, the idea is first you have to find the magnetopause. So we did that. Um, this uh, is an animation. These little green dots are where we find the magnetopause to be, and this blue line is the separator. So sure, the separator should be falling in the magnetopause, so it is. So that's good. Uh, so from that, we were able to do everything we wanted, go upstream, get the, the plasma parameters on the magnetospheric side, on the magnetosheet side, and wow, it keeps going, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so get all the plasma parameters we want, and then we can test all these models. Um, and the way we test it is most of the models are in terms of, well, if some parameter is a maximum, then that's where reconnection should happen. Um, and so we tested that using um, uh, image processing type technique, techniques. So for example, so the, the leading model is what's called the maximum magnetic shear model. So the idea is reconnection happens wherever the magnetic fields are most anti-parallel. Um, and so this is a plot. The blue dots are for every position, every point on the magnetopause. We find what the angle between the magnetic fields are and plot it here. So these are uh, basically projected down to the YZ plane, and then the height gives you the angle between the magnetic fields. So we used image processing techniques to find uh, what's called the ridge. Basically, that uh, you're basically just doing uh, calculus, second derivative type test to see where maximum is. Uh, it's just in this crazy geometry. And so from that, you can say, well, this is what the magnetic shear model would predict where reconnection would happen. And then we know where reconnection does happen because we have the separator. So then we can compare everything we want for tons of different models. Um, so I'm not going to show you all sorts of data on this. I'm just going to go through one example. This is for the maximum magnetic shear model um, for a, a bunch of different um, ang clock angles for the interplanetary magnetic field. Uh, the white line is the separator that we uh, found, and the uh, gray dots are the points, the ridge, it's where the prediction is. And so if everything was perfect for a given model, the white line and the gray dots would be right on top of each other. So this one, you might look at it and say it's not all that great, but let's focus first on these, uh, the bottom three, which are uh, uh, interplanetary magnetic fields with southward component. So for 120, it does pretty good. Um, for 150, it starts looking like it's less great, but it's still pretty good. Um, and then if you compare this with all the other models, it turns out basically all the models are pretty good within a little bit of a range um, for southward IMF. Um, and then the, the interesting part we found is for northward IMF. So it turns out all the other models we tested, so where you, for northward IMF, you, you know, what we were conditioned to believe is that reconnection happens most near the cusps, the top and the bottom of the magnetosphere. Uh, and so that's this little part, the white part right here. And it turns out the only model that was able to get us uh, agreement in that region was the maximum magnetic shear model. All the other ones sort of went off in some other direction. So we're basically, we're kind of, <laughs> we're trying to not be too dogmatic with it, but at the very least, we're trying to say that nothing agreed perfectly, but the only one that got the northward IMF reconnection site at the cusp was the maximum shear model. So, uh, the 165 the up there, so you're going more towards south. Yes. Uh, to the right the yeah. 
So for 180, it's... Yeah. Yeah. For one, well, so for 180, everything's in the ecliptic plane for all the models. So that's perfect agreement for everything. The reason we... Yeah, oh, that's a... <laughs> this, whoops. Sorry. This black line is where Chatner would have found it. So there's, and ours is the gray one, so for 165. So those agree pretty well. So the, they didn't use image processing techniques. They sort of used some other hand wavy way to do it. But ours and theirs agree. What's that? Oh, yeah, yeah. But with their data, they projected everything kind of like, they, I mean, that's where we got our motivation from is they plotted everything on the XY plane and they looked for ridges, but they did it differently than, than we did. Yeah, yeah, they used a magnetic sheath model, magnetic spheric model to, to get that. That's right. Um, so to answer your question, Bill, um, what happens is, uh, and actually um, Steve Petrenik just had a paper on this too. So this, um, this, so this has a saddle shape to it. And so you're basically finding the ridge on that saddle. Um, as you get closer to 180, that saddle smooths out. It gets, so the, it's very sensitive to where you're drawing lines. You're, it's much more sensitive to uncertainty for those. And so that's why you know, when, we, when we first looked at our data, we said, oh, OK, the maximum shear model doesn't work for this. Because we said, oh, it's, it's too far off. But we're, we're backing off on that and saying the uncertainty is sufficient that these are pretty close. So I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if you buy that, but. <laughs> um. Yeah, right, right. And it's really hard with the data, too. Yeah, especially when you're, you're mapping it to models of the magnetic sheet and the magnetic sphere. So there's uncertainty with that, too. Yeah, you can say it like that. Yep. <laughs> yep. The other, the, the age old debate on this was uh, anti parallel versus component. So that's what they refer to. Yep. Yeah, but we basically think, both from the data and from the simulations, we think the anti parallel component debate is just a non issue. It's, it's the wrong question to ask because you can find cases where it's anti parallel, you can find cases where it's component. So neither, you can't just say it's always component or it's always anti parallel. Just doesn't work. Well, it's maximum shear, <laughs> so it's as close as you can get to anti-parallel. <laughs> That's right. That's one of these other models. Yeah, um, people talked about the maximum outflow speed, the maximum reconnection rate. Um, geometrical things, so just uh, like the, the, the angle bisecting the two magnetic fields, things like that, or the direction of the current, all sorts of things. Yep. Okay. Um, and then, so I just wanted to sort of give you a teaser about where we're going with this, because like I said, I think there's a huge number of questions. I think in the next couple of years, I think these types of studies are really start Re, I don't want to be too brash, but I think they kind of rewrite some of the book on what we thought dayside reconnection looked like. Um, because now that we have these separators which tell us where reconnection is, we can really study it. Um, and so the reconnection plane is normal to the separator. Okay, So now that we have all these separators, you can plot the plane perpendicular to the separator. And um, that's plotted here. The background, they're both the same background. Um, this is the out of plane current. And so um, uh, the top one is magnetic fields in that plane. So this, the Earth would be down here. You can see these are the closed field lines. And this would be the interplanetary magnetic field lines. This is the bow shock, in case anyone's interested. Um, and so it kind of looks like a 2D reconnection picture. It's a little warped because the magnetosphere is warped. Um, and then this one is what the flow looks like in that plane. These are the streamlines. And so you can see that you know, out here the flow kind of goes around, but in here it goes right into the reconnection region and gets redirected out by the reconnection. In here you can't see much because the flow on the magnetospheric side is very slow. Um, but anyway, it looks kind of like reconnection. <laughs> so, yeah. The color is the out of plane current density. So it's right here is where the magnetic field's changing direction, so you get a big current out of the page. 
yeah. and that x is the separator, which in 2D would just, we would just call the x line where the fields break. Um, so we can study this stuff to death now, and we have the separators, you know, for all these, right, we can go everywhere along the separator, we can go, you know, change the interplanetary magnetic field parameters, and we can really study this, and we're currently testing these 2D reconnection models to see if they work. And I'm really wanting to tell you what our results are, but they're not quite ready for prime time. Um, but I think it's going to be really interesting. So uh, I'm just going to say stay tuned, because I think there's some really interesting stuff coming. Um, and yeah, furthermore, again, going back to this question of local versus global, I really think that we're going to be able to address these questions now that we can really characterize what's going on locally, whereas it was really difficult to do that before. All right. So. Um, let me start, I, mean, I probably won't finish this one, but let me at least tell you about it. This is more from the solar side for the, so the solar folks. Um, so the, another question we were asking about was, again, you know, the real world's 3D. And so you don't, you can't have 2D reconnection forever. It's got to end somewhere. So what happens if reconnection is localized in a little space in 3D? Um, and what tends to happen is, especially if the current is nice and uniform, is um, the, the reconnection, the part where reconnection is going on will spread uh, in three dimensions. And so we've, we wanted to study that. And it turns out there's a lot of really neat applications for where this comes up. Um, so here is an image of the Bastille Day flare. Um, so this is, um, you can see some of the ribbons. This is a two ribbon flare. So you can see the ribbons to the top and bottom. And as I animate it, you'll see the other ribbon come up here and a little bit over here. And so the standard, I'm going to take you through this a little bit, the standard you expect for the ribbons in a two ribbon flare is that they'll move apart with the idea that you're getting new reconnected field lines coming down on top and that's the part that gives off the, the radiation and so it looks, it, it's an apparent motion, it looks like it's moving off to the side. Oops. Um, but what you also see here is that it's spread this way. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about spreading. So uh, if reconnection is happening way out here, causing these loops, uh, reconnected loops here, the idea is that it's spreading in the third direction um, to the left and right. Okay? Um, turns out prominence eruptions, they also see this. So it doesn't start everywhere at once. It starts in one place and kind of grows. Um, there's an application to what are called super arcade downflows, which I probably won't get too much of a time to, chance to talk about. Um, and then it also occurs in the solar wind. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about this, but the idea is that um, using multi-satellites, multi people have measured the same exhaust going by different satellites that were separated by huge amounts. And so they said, well, okay, the same exhaust is coming from, the same, coming from a single reconnection event. And they said, well, maybe that means the whole reconnection event is really big. Well, you know, they didn't know because, you know, you can't measure right where the reconnection is happening. So they're kind of assuming that it's already big. Well, what if it's localized? Could you have localized reconnection give you the same exhaust at different satellites spread out? Um, so really interesting questions about that. Um, so this one, it turns out to be very sensitive to the guide field. And most of the, there had been previous studies on this, but most people didn't use a guide field. That's because in the magneto tail, where you see reconnection spreading, there's not much of a guide field. So a lot of the studies just assumed anti-parallel reconnection. Uh, but it turns out, we argued that the guide field is crucial because it gives you another avenue for allowing the reconnection to spread because it can basically just go along the, the field line. So it, it um, travels at the Alphane speed of the, of the total magnetic field. And without a guide field, it's basically just dragged by a current. Um, so we argued that you get qualitatively different spreading characteristics with a guide field than without. And there's some crossover point. So again, in keeping with the idea of not giving you too many details, these are results from three-dimensional simulations. The idea is that you're looking down from the top, and we take where the maximum of the current is, and plot it as a function of this direction, and then we plot that as a function of time as reconnection goes on. And these are different guide field strengths. So you can see some, so guide field of three, which is big in this case, uh, you see everything spreading both up and down. And here's a guide field of zero, and everything's just spreading in one direction. And so this really does show that the guide field is, is really important. Um, we went through, we did a little calculation to predict 
uh, where that changeover is, and we think it's about two, and that's consistent with the simulations we get to. So, when should I stop, by the way? <laughs> a couple minutes? All right, I'll just go a couple more minutes, then we'll stop. Um, so, one application of this I mentioned was these ribbons and two ribbon flares. Um, so, I wanted to show you some really neat results that Zhang Chu has had. She's at Montana State. Um, so what she's done, which is really neat, is you can just measure as a function of time what these ribbons are doing. And so she's color-coded it here. So black is uh, early in time, and then going up to red is late in time. And so you can see exactly how these things evolve, and you can measure them uh, as a function of time in different directions. And so she sees some events where this is now the position this way as a function of time this way. And you can see it's spreading up and spreading down. So it's spreading in both directions. And then this is a completely different event, and it basically spreads completely in one direction. You get uh, motion this way, but not this way. And so real flares spread either unidirectionally or bidirectionally, um, or the ribbons anyway. And the other really neat thing that she's been able to figure out is from the, the structure of the ribbons, the post, or not the ribbons, but the loops, the post flare loops, just from looking at what angle they're at, you can sort of estimate what the strength of that guide field is compared to the reconnecting part. And it turns out that the one here that spreads bidirectionally has a significant guide field of order, the same order of magnitude as the reconnecting field. And this one doesn't really have much of a guide field. So it's kind of an amazing application, I think. Um, and it really agrees with the theory as well. So um, again, I think there'll be some really neat uh, future work on this subject. Um, I think I'll sort of skip this other than to just say that um, there are, so what we did, we also did simulations where instead of letting the reconnection spread, we forced it to stay localized in one space and let, this, let the um, system go. And so you can see this would be one with a large guide field where it's localized. And you can see that it, uh, the, this is a plot of what the exhausts are doing, so what the flow is. So this one's to the right and this one's to the left. So you can see if you're a spacecraft down here, if you're just going from here to here, you might see an extended exhaust. And so this, um, where this is important is, I'm going to skip that, where this is important is this event in the solar wind I was mentioning. There's a number of events now. So they see, uh, you know, ACE and Cluster and Wind see, um, saw the same exhaust, and so uh, Typhon et al. S suggested that you had this really extended X line. And so this is what I was trying to suggest before. Well, how do we know that, and they even said this in their paper, you know, how do they know that it's not just a really short reconnection region that spreads out? So this picture, so this is kind of interesting too, this picture might suggest that uh, it can spread out, so maybe it could have been localized. Um, but it turns out that this is a function, how much it spreads out is a function of the guide field. And in their event, the guide field was fairly small. It's about, point, uh, it's about a third of the reconnecting field. And so, again, I'm skipping a lot of details, but just from their data and from what we now understand about what localized reconnection looks like, the claim is that uh, the X line they saw was at least 100 RE. So that's a macro scale, that's not a micro scale. So we think that they were correct in saying that that's not, um, that it wasn't a localized reconnection. It was really huge. And this is just the minimum bound, so it's probably larger than that. Um, so I think I'm gonna skip the tadpole stuff, and I'll skip this. And in the interest of time, I'll just go right to the conclusions. Um, so anyway, so hopefully it gave you a little bit of a tour of both uh, magnetospheric reconnection studies and uh, solar corona reconnection studies. Um, important stuff, so, uh, you know, sort of have this new idea of the effect of flow shear on reconnection, getting some really cool results on uh, how to find reconnection in global simulations and then studying it locally, um, and then this spreading of 3D reconnection. Um, what I didn't get to right here, I'll just say a couple words on it, is um, there's this age-old question of what causes reconnection to be fast. And uh, maybe you've heard of the GEM Reconnection Challenge study from uh, 2001. And they basically found that any, uh, any uh, system that contained the Hall term was fast. And if you have resistive MHD, it's not fast. And so they said, OK, well, it's the Hall term that gives you fast reconnection. Um, that study didn't have a guide field. And so what we recently found is that 
when you do have a guide field, there's another mechanism that can give you fast reconnection. And it turns out if you have an electron pressure anisotropy included in the generalized Ohm's law, um, we just use the uh, CGL equations for that. Uh, it turns out you get fast reconnection even without the Hall term. So that was a very surprising result for us because for a long time we were very focused on the Hall term. So it turns out there's other things. So um, really trying to pin down that physics, you know, it's, it's a whole, whole other set of uh, parameters we can study for that. Uh, so yeah, I think I'll stop there. So thank you all for your attention. Thanks for coming. Um, so I have a question for you about something you didn't explicitly address. Okay. Um, but as a reconnection guru, you might know the answer to or refute. But I have this impression that um, almost independently of whether we're talking about observations, MHD simulations, kinetic simulations, the reconnection rate is a tenth of an <laughs> L-phase speed. Why? Or is it not? If you figure it out, let me know. I'll be happy to put you on the paper. <laughs> yeah, we've been studying that for a long time. Um, people have different ideas on it. Um, you know, I've had, there was a time where I was thinking about this every day. I'd, you know, I'd come into, when I was a grad student especially, I'd come in and show my advisor, oh, you know, I think I explained the point one issue. Uh, and then you'd find a hole in it, and I'd go home and try it again. So short answer is we don't know, and we still don't know. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm hoping things like this might, you know, it's another data point to try to figure that out. So I wish I had a better answer. <laughs> Hey, Paul, thanks for the um, great overview of reconnection. I'm trying to balance two, two apparent contradictions, and maybe I just misunderstood what you're saying. With the, with the asymmetric reconnection in the flow shear, it seems to imply that the solar wind driving is going to be dominating the reconnection at the magnetopause because of the, the strength of the flow and whatnot. And how does that balance with the influence of something like plasmaspheric material coming from the magneto sheet side, where you wouldn't think from the, the what you were just talking about with the asymmetric side that it would have much influence on the, on the overall reconnection thing? So maybe I misunderstood. Or, or no, no, great question. Um, I, I might have overstated it. So uh, I don't, I wouldn't say that the, um, what's going on at the, uh, on the magnetospheric side shouldn't do anything. Because the idea is that where this, this stagnation point is located is a function of the density and field on either side. So let's say you have the plasmaspheric plume come up and it reaches the reconnection site, it's going to shift this stagnation point down. And then it totally changes everything, and it definitely could play a role. It definitely does play a role. And so yeah, people, there's been observations now that it slows down the reconnection and, and things like that. So yes, good, good point. And the other thing I should mention with this is this all assumed that the X line was free to move. Um, if you're you know, a reconnection site in the cusp and your line tied to the ionosphere, maybe it can't just freely move with the solar wind. And so if that's the case, maybe this doesn't apply so well. So these are things we have to figure out later. And since I still have the microphone and I don't see any hands coming up, um, Paul and a group of us are going to go out to dinner tonight. Uh, if you're interested in joining us, please see me after the, the session. Another question? Uh, kind of a naive question. Uh, going back to Phil's question, he was asking about the, you know, the uh, diffusivity, number of diffusivity used. And it seems that like you assume that uh, it will always be larger. You said the six or seven grid size. How about the connect reconnection region be smaller than your grid cell? Or That's a great question too. So this is part of what I haven't, um, <laughs> what I haven't, uh, what we're not presenting yet, but um, we found a really interesting effect. So we're looking at you know, these 2D parameters, uh, or these 2D models to see if they agree with the 3D uh, magnetospheric, right? Or with the, the full 3D magnetosphere. And what we find is that it, it's actually the same picture that tells you where the problem is. Um, the more asymmetric the system is, the more the X line and the stagnation point gets shifted. And so at some point, um, this distance here is going to be smaller than a grid cell. So even though you have eight cells across, let's say eight cells across the current sheet, you could have only one cell in that really important part where the plasma would want to turn corners. And so if you're not resolving it sufficiently, you get, it messes up the results. 
right? And I've seen that even in 2D simulations, not just the magnetosphere. Um, yeah, so there's, there's resolution issues beyond just saying I need a certain number of grid cells across a current sheet. Thank Paul again. Thank you.